Welcome to the teaching on performance orientation. Pray that it'll be a blessing for you and bring you great levels of freedom. Quoting from John Sanford's book, performance orientation is a term which refers not to the service we perform, but to false motives which impel us. That'll be a key principle here. It's not the doing, it's the motives behind the doing that matter. Having brought performance orientation to death, we may do exactly the same works in much the same ways, but from an entirely different intent in the heart. In bringing performance orientation to death, we're not saying to stop serving or stop doing, but to die to the wrong hidden intents in the heart. This teaching on performance orientation has been one of the most impactful of any that we've done. There are many reasons for this, mostly because one way or another, every person suffers from this problem. That's meant to be an encouragement to you, not a discouragement. We all have to fight this gravitational pull of finding our identity in what we do instead of who we are. And who we are are sons and daughters of a loving father. You might remember a man named Jack Frost who came and ministered at our church, if you've been with us for a while. He passed away, but I think part of his story could be very telling for this teaching on performance orientation. Like any child, he wanted his father's approval, so... When he was told he kept falling short of the goal that his dad had set, he tried harder. Jack and his brother were tennis players when they were growing up, and they were expected to perform at a very high level. But no matter how hard he tried, his father was never satisfied. That's not an uncommon situation, sorry to say. But in the child, it leads to frustration and anger and bitterness. Everyone wants to feel accepted. But when we're continually being told that we're falling short, we start to give up and anger sets into our hearts. Jack wrote a book called Experience in the Father's Embrace, which I highly recommend, and digs deeper into some of these principles on performance orientation. Grab that book. I'll give you a quick little overview of his story just to make the point. Jack grew up in a home where his dad had a military background and was a very strong disciplinarian. No matter how hard Jack tried to please his dad, it never seemed to be good enough. So Jack took out his anger on his father by rebelling against that authority and left home as a teenager, turned to drugs and alcohol. He was living in northern Florida on the coast and eventually turned to making his livelihood as a commercial fisherman. Thankfully, eventually the Lord broke through all the pain and he became a very impactful minister, touching thousands of lives, the main message being the unconditional love of the father. A big part of Jack's story is how damaging performance orientation was in his life and how much freedom he received when that root was finally brought to the cross and crucified. One of the vivid pictures Jack paints was about his life as a commercial fisherman. His upbringing turned him into a very competitive, angry adult. And while he kept his boat down at the docks with all the other commercial fishermen, there was this real macho culture that they lived in. You might remember the movie Perfect Storm. It was very similar. You could equate... Jack Frost to the George Clooney character. Every night, the fishermen would compare their daily catch at the, as they sat around the bar. and There was a board on the dock that tallied how many pounds of fish each boat brought in that day. The boat that made the top of the list with the most pounds of fish would be called Top Hook. And that became Jack's obsession. His crew and his boat had to be listed as Top Hook. They'd spend many days away from home fishing, and when they returned and weighed their catch, if they weren't the top hook, Jack would fly into a rage, restock the boat, and make the crew head right back out to sea again. So it's not hard to see why he had trouble keeping anyone working for him on his crew for long. Years later, as a Christian, he could look back at that, and he referred to himself as Captain Ahab. At the time, though, he couldn't understand that the root system that was feeding all his anger was the rejection that he felt from his father for not measuring up to his dad's standards. The only way Jack could feel good about himself was to outperform other people. But that is an impossible goal, a losing strategy, and it destined him to failure. There's one part of Jack's story that has always stuck out to me. Once he and his crew were too far out to sea and were caught in a horrible storm, much like the movie Perfect Storm, it looked like the ship was not going to make it back to port. Waves were crashing into the boat, and one large wave came right over the front of the boat, smashed the windshield, and it sent glass and wood flying into Jack's face, his body. He was bleeding, and he was sure he was going to die. Right at that moment, he had a flashback to a time when he was a young boy playing Little League Baseball. 
These flashbacks are a similar situation that many people describe when they think they're about to die. Their life is flashing before their eyes and memories suddenly start springing up to the surface that might have been laying dormant for years. It seems strange to Jack that with all the things that he had experienced in his life, that this scene would emerge from the depths of his memory of him playing Little League Baseball. Remember, Jack's dad was a hard-driving man, so baseball was never fun for him. There was always criticism coming from his father about all the things that Jack was doing wrong. And during one particular game, he'd gone to bat in an important part of the game, and instead of getting a hit, he had struck out. A father of one of Jack's teammates pulled him aside after the game and put him on his knee, put an arm around his shoulder, and encouraged him that it was going to be okay, that it was okay that he had struck out. Don't worry, Jack, he said. You'll get another chance. You'll do great next time. And the irony is of all the things that this big, strong, commercial fisherman macho guy could have thought of at the moment he thought he was going to die, this is the memory that sprung up from deep within his heart. He just wanted to know that he was okay. We all strike out. All of us are looking for validation and affirmation. That's what he was looking for from his dad. But he didn't get it, and that's what set him into this striving and this need for approval that we call performance orientation. In a nutshell, that's what we're all looking for. Someone to tell us that our identity doesn't come from what we do, but our identity comes from who we are. And as I said, the main truth about who we are is that we're sons and daughters of a loving Father God, and nothing can separate us from that love, even if we're not the top hook. You might know the verse from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. That's a wonderful truth, and we should all meditate on the fact that we can't earn our salvation. We understand that concept in our minds, we can't earn God's love by working harder. In fact, if someone asks you, what can you do to make God love you more? The right answer we should give is nothing. There's nothing we can do to make him love us more. That's true. He already loves you in a way that can't be measured. But understanding that with our minds is not enough. That knowledge has to transfer deep down into our hearts. The knowledge that we're unconditionally loved by the Father at the deepest heart level. So you can see why performance orientation is such a dangerous brew, but it's not hard to see how it happens. Our American culture breeds performance orientation into children, even in families where the parents aren't as severe as Jack Frost's dad was. Think about piano lessons, pressure to get the highest grades, competing in sports. In so many areas, we're taught that we must compete and we must win. Our culture adopted the phrase, winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. Well, the original phrase, winning isn't everything, was a good thing. It was designed to help us understand that there are so many benefits just by participating in sports. You get mental discipline, you develop your physical strength, you learn to be a member of a team. You're going to benefit from playing even if your team doesn't win. So if you lost a game, the coach would say, hey, don't worry, winning isn't everything. But the American culture wasn't satisfied with just good sportsmanship. It elevated winning to be an idol. Unfortunately, that worldview can still creep into the church, and it has terrible results. But the church Jesus wants and desires should be full of people who cooperate, co-labor together to build a healthy community filled with unconditional love. The goal is to win the lost and to grow Christians into mature believers. The church was never meant to operate in a competitive, performance-oriented culture. In fact, when competition arose among the disciples, Jesus was quick to identify it and quick to correct it. It's found in Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. It says, The mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. Jesus said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left, in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You don't know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? They said to him, We are able. Verse 23, So he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it's for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. Now here's where we can see the unhealthy side of this. 
These two disciples actually brought their mother to speak to Jesus on their behalf. But there wasn't just two disciples, there were 12 disciples. So verse 24 says, when the 10 heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. We've got a sibling rivalry kicking up now. There's competition. The 10 are upset that the two tried to move up the ranks ahead of them. Verse 25, but when Jesus called them to himself, he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So we don't have to look far. Jesus sets the example for us. He wasn't striving. He understood his role as a son. He didn't take his identity in his position. If you have a need in your heart to be recognized by men, you need to bring that need to crucifixion at the cross of Christ. Jesus even warned us about this in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 says, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Then in verse 4, When you bring your offering, don't let other people know about it. Do it in secret. I'm summarizing. Verse 6, when you pray, do it in secret. Verse 17, when you fast, don't let people know that you're fasting. Verse 16 says, the people who do these things to be seen by men, I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full. So just to keep a balance, there's nothing wrong with people acknowledging your gift in church. You serve in a ministry and people compliment you. That's fine. But the basic biblical principle behind it is that shouldn't be our motive. Jesus said it so beautifully. We're to do these things behind the scenes because our Father who sees in secret rewards us openly. Here's a quote from the Sanford's book, Transformation of the Inner Man, the chapter on performance orientation. John Sanford writing says, the constant propensity of the born anew is to fall back into striving by human effort. Our minds and spirits know the free gift of salvation, but our hearts retain their habit to earn love by performing. Most commonly, we who are saved are unaware that other motives than God's love have begun to corrupt our serving into striving and tension and fear. Performing may soon so intertwine falsely with love that we cannot conceive of being loved unless we performed rightly. Or worse, we come to believe that not performing earns us rejection. So even if someone gives us love, we think we didn't deserve it and either won't receive the love offered or false guilt assails us. At the core is a lie that says I'm only going to be loved if I perform well. And our hearts laminate two things together which should be separated, behaving well and being loved. We need to be stopped by firm hands of correction while being at the same time warmly held and accepted just when we've been at our worst. That says love is unconditional, and it writes into the heart that love is a gift, fully given, that cannot be lost. It creates security. So that's our goal. We've got to reach that place of unconditional love. The reality is that most of us are not there. So what we do is look for these symptoms, the fruit, and then we track back to the root. There's an insidious root system that makes performance orientation so toxic, but in an ironic way, it's also appealing. It feeds something in us that God wants crucified on the cross, the idea that I can control my destiny with my own efforts. I can rule my own kingdom through striving and effort. A button gets pushed inside us called selfish ambition, and then it morphs and mutates into self-reliance, which produces pride and ego, where my agenda becomes primary, not God's agenda for my life. When you look up the word insidious in the dictionary, the definition says intended to entrap or beguile, stealthily treacherous or deceitful, operating or proceeding in an inconspicuous or seemingly harmless way, but actually with grave effect. And boy, that's a definition of performance orientation. On the one hand, it looks noble. The person who's caught up in this is performing and doing much. 
and many times good things. The problem is it's the motive that's behind it is toxic. The engine is running on bad fuel. We can look at James chapter 3, verse 14. says, But if you harbor in your hearts bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, don't boast about it or deny the truth. Such quote-unquote wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. For where there are jealousy and selfish ambition, there will be disharmony and every foul practice. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure, then peaceful, kind, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Peacemakers who sow seed in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. That's our prayer, Lord. Just remove that selfish ambition, that striving, that jealousy, that competitive spirit. We want to operate as your church the way you designed it, the church that the gates of hell will not prevail against. Wherever there's bad fuel running our engine, we want it out, and we want to serve for the right motive. We can even stop right now for a minute and just think about what we've learned so far in these first few minutes on this CD. The teaching can be a little overwhelming. Everybody suffers from some form of performance orientation at one level or another. The good news is that the cross, the blood of Jesus, and the power of resurrection work together to destroy that root, that root of wrong motives, and we receive freedom to fulfill God's given destiny in our lives. In John's words in the book, he wrote, This book is intended to be experiential, not detached. It may be slow reading. No one should feel guilty if he cannot get through much of it at a time. Many people will have to put the book down and ponder it for a while. It may require return readings as the heart becomes more fertile soil. In fact, whoever reads it may be less nice to be around for a while as thoughts and emotions are stirred. The first fruits of the teaching may even seem bad, tempting one to put the book down and go celebrate the joys of faith. But John encourages us, no, hold on with patience because unripe fruit usually tastes sour. Don't hurry. Most foods taste better when cooked slowly. Good fruits will come. Don't do too much reading and listening without friends to talk with. Don't rush out to tell everybody what's wrong with them. The church can easily do without that. Especially don't beleaguer the pastor. He'll get there soon enough without your help. And you survived this long with all the mess intact. Let's not try to straighten it up all at once. God knows the way through the wilderness. Amen to that. I'm going to stop here and read you Paula Sanford's testimony with John commenting, since this happened to be an area in Paula's life that had a big stronghold, and I believe her testimony will really help you understand some of the deeper concepts behind the teaching. John Sanford starts out by saying, now Paula's going to testify about her own performance orientation, and as she does... I'm going to interrupt her every once in a while to list for you the symptoms of performance orientation. Paula starts by saying, There was never any time in my life when I did not have a tremendous need to succeed. I was never satisfied with anything but an A in school. I made it all the way through grade school and high school making straight A's except for one B+. And I was absolutely undone by that one B+. That may sound ridiculous, to let that one lack of perfection take away all the joys that I had had. John now comes in and says, one of the first symptoms for performance orientation is that these folks have a need to succeed. They have to succeed. The reason they have to succeed is not for the sake of others. It's because of fear of rejection. They have success connected with being accepted. They have to do it right in order to be accepted. The second symptom is that they lose their joy. Life becomes too serious, too heavy. They say, I've got to do it right or I won't be loved. Back to Paula. Because I was trying so hard to do everything perfectly, I needed to be complimented for that. But John was raised in a family where nobody complimented anybody ever. John says, it was Oklahoma. We were in a rancher culture. The thinking was, a man who's worth his salt will work whether he's complimented or not. So you don't ever compliment anybody. Paula says, since John was the most important person in my life, it really affected me that he never complimented me, so I would wrangle and manipulate to try to get him to give me a compliment. 
Then when he would give me a compliment, I'd have trouble believing it was sincere. If I did manage to believe he was sincere about the compliment, then I would think, well, I'll have to do better next time. I was always measuring. My father once came to me and said, you know, Paula, you don't have to measure what you do against what someone else does. So then I did quit doing that, but I started measuring my performance against what I had done myself last time. John chimes in. The next list of symptoms, performance-oriented people don't have their own center of security within themselves. Their security is in what people think about them. That's why they become people-pleasers. They're not secure inside themselves, so they need to wrangle compliments from others. Then if you do compliment them, they have to live up to that new standard, and that raises the bar. The next symptom is that nobody in the family of a performance-oriented person is able to rest. Because the performance-oriented person is not only measuring how they are doing, they also measure how well you are doing. Everybody has to live up to the standard. This is because the performance-oriented person must look good. So if you're married to the performance-oriented person, you have to look good in order for them to look good. And then the discipline for the children is not always for the child's sake. It's based on the same issue. If the child misbehaves, it makes her look bad as a parent. So there's control and manipulation in the home of a performance-oriented person. Paula comes back and says, I had a great deal of difficulty receiving any kind of criticism, especially from my husband. Just to be clear, there were times that he really was criticizing me, but there were other times when he was just given a helpful suggestion. But I even viewed those helpful suggestions as criticism. I was compulsively defensive. I'd have to explain to him why I had not done it the way he was suggesting that I should do it. He would say, you don't have to be defensive, Paula. And I would then defend the fact that I had defended myself. John says, the next symptom is that you never win with a PO person. When I would give Paula a suggestion on how to do something better, she would say, well, you aren't doing so good yourself. And John would say, I know I'm not doing so well myself, but we're not talking about me right now. We're talking about you. Paula's answer to that was, I did not want to talk about me. I'd rather talk about him. You might be wondering how on earth we could have been married for over 50 years if we had all these problems. But I can assure you, Paula says, things have gotten better and better as we have grown, and the grace of God has been sufficient for us. Paula, again, I always felt responsible for everything. I had to make things work. As a pastor's wife, I even felt responsible to make God look good. We had to have a full and rich program in the church. I couldn't let anything fail, which meant that I couldn't say no. If somebody asked me to do something, I would say yes, no matter how loaded I already was. So I became very busy, overly busy. There was a time when we didn't have a youth pastor in the church, so they asked me to do that. I said, okay, I'll do that. I was asked to do something with the children's choir because the children wanted to sing, so I did that. There was a time when we didn't have anyone to play the organ. I was never trained to play the organ. I played a little bit of piano, but for a while, I actually played the organ. If a woman's group needed someone to give a talk, I would say yes. And it just kept going on and on until I was so overloaded that John came up with a comment one day that was just excruciatingly wounding to me. John said, I wish I had married a dumb blonde who didn't know how to do anything but just love up on me. And I thought to myself, Paula says, what an ungrateful nerd. In addition to all the things that I was saying yes to for all the people in the church, John was bringing things home from the office at the church. He didn't have a secretary. He'd bring things home for me to type. I typed out the Sunday bulletin and anything else he asked me to do. Now John commenting on symptoms. If you have a condition in you and you're not hearing the Lord to get it to death on the cross, what the Lord will do is overload the system until it just crushes the structure. Paula says, my system was so overloaded, I was tired, just very tired most of the time. John would come home and say, just relax. But then I would strive to relax. John's saying, more symptoms. One of them is that the performance-oriented person cannot let anything fail out of fear, fear of not being loved, and that God and the church will not look good. Another symptom is that the performance-oriented person can't relax. Another one is that they feel unappreciated. They're actually doing too much, 
The other people just let them do it. And then the performance oriented person feels unappreciated. Paula says, anger was building up inside of me. But a good Christian obviously is not angry. John would comment and say, Paula, you're always so angry. I would say, no, I'm not. I would say, John, look, these are my feelings. I ought to know how I feel, and I am not angry. John says another symptom. Performance-oriented people cannot admit what they really feel. They've got to put forth a good face so that they will be doing it right. They're unaware of their own inner motives. Paula says, we never quarreled in front of our children as a rule, but one time John and I were discussing this issue of my anger and our oldest son came in the room and heard the tail end of the conversation. Our son said, mom, I just have to tell you, sometimes you can have a smile on your face and your voice sounds calm, but I feel something different coming from your spirit. I feel anger flowing. Paula now reflects and says, you know, I had to hear that from my son. Somehow the Holy Spirit drove that right into the inside of me, and I had to begin to deal with that truth and recognize that it was my sin. John saying again, another symptom. Performance-oriented people have anger smoldering behind their eyes, but they cannot admit it because they have got to maintain their good Christian image. They think anger is a sin, but anger is not a sin. Jesus never sinned, but Mark 3, 5 says that Jesus looked around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of their heart. So that lets us know it's possible to be angry and not be in sin. But the performance-oriented person thinks that anger is sin, so they cannot admit that they're angry. Paula again says, anger only becomes sin based on what we do with it. If we use it as a weapon against someone and then we blast them with it, it certainly becomes sin. John kept telling me, you need to go to someone and have them pray for you. I'm your husband, so I can't do it for you because I'm too close. So naturally, me being a performance-oriented person, I was going to go do this right. I found some people who were really good intercessors, and I went to them for prayer. It turned out that every one of them would do much the same thing. They would start out praying for me, get three or four sentences out, and then they would be saying, Oh, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful woman who does all these wonderful things. I would get home thinking, either John is absolutely mistaken about what's going on inside me, or these people have missed me altogether. What I didn't realize is that I carried with me a kind of poise that made me sort of a con artist. I did not know that I was doing that, but that poise was a kind of defense between me and them, and they couldn't see through it. John chimes in. Then Paul would come home and say to me, John, you're going to have to do it. I would think, oh, no, not again. Every time I try to point out a fault, she's going to revert back to that idea that, well, you're not doing so good either, John. So John says more symptoms. Performance-oriented people are poised, and they are con artists. They can fool the best counselors. Paula says again, John would say to me, trying to talk with you, Paula, is like running into a wall. And I would say back to John, well, John, if you really loved me, you would jump over the wall. I was so lonely. A friend of mine said to me one day, Paula, I don't feel like I've ever gotten to know you. I wondered, what on earth is she talking about? I've known her for years. We worked together. We prayed together. What she was trying to tell me was that I had only let her see the exterior part of me. I had never let her know that I had needs inside, that I had pains, that I had grief. I had always made it look like everything was just fine with me. So she really turned out to be right. She never really got to know the real me. John chimes in, another symptom. Performance-oriented people are deeply lonely inside. But the other symptom that goes with it is that they are always very secretive. They play it close to the vest. When others confess their sins in a group, they comfort them, but they don't make their own confession. Or they may confess a few surface things so that they feel like they played the game and did it right, but they won't confess the real hurts inside. Paula says, All of this is unconscious, hidden to ourselves. The job of the Holy Spirit is to search the innermost parts of our being and make us aware of what is really down there. He gives us the strength to really deal with it. So about this time, John was about ready to give up. 
He said, I can't seem to get it across to you, so the Lord is going to have to show you what it is. And Paul says, at the same time, I was saying, I give up. Lord, you're going to have to show me. So the Lord took advantage of a situation that I got in. I'm not saying that he brought it on me, but he did meet me there and taught me what I needed to know in the middle of that circumstance. At the time, I was working as a substitute teacher in a town in the mountains of Idaho. In the fall season, we get black ice on the roads before the snows fall. You don't see it, but it's as slick as can be. One day, I was driving down the mountain pass and hit a patch of that black ice. The van spun, hit the guardrail, and rolled two and a half times. It came to rest on its top, but before it came to rest, I had gone headfirst through the windshield, and I had landed absolutely flat on the pavement. The doctor told me he knew that I had landed flat because if I had not, I would have broken my back and been paralyzed or killed. One of our oldest daughter's friends witnessed the accident and saw me fly through the window. He said it looked like an angel caught me in midair and let me down to the ground. I was in the hospital for about two and a half weeks, unable to do anything for anybody. Touching my head was like touching a squishy water balloon. I had cuts and bruises all over. I was a bright purple color in many places on my body. I really didn't feel the pain from the cuts and bruises because I had so badly injured my back. The doctor described it to me by saying that four of the little knobs that are on the lumbar vertebra had simply popped off when I hit the pavement. So I was in a lot of pain. While I was in the hospital not able to do anything for anybody, people brought me flowers. So many people came to visit me that they had to let them in a few at a time. The rest of them were crowded out in the waiting room. There were several doctors in the hospital that were not even on my case, but I was aware from time to time that they were standing at the foot of my bed praying. Telephone calls came in from all over the country. People were calling John and saying, I was led to pray for you. What's going on out there? People in the church and some of my neighbors took over everything that I had been doing. They came in and did my laundry took care of my children, cleaned my house, cooked food for the family, did errands for the family. As soon as my face was presentable, they brought our youngest daughter in to tuck me into bed at night. Everything was done for me, and I could not reciprocate for any of the gifts that they were giving me. Now John comes in and says, the next symptom of a performance-oriented person is that if you do something for them, you put them in a position of debt where they feel that they must do something back for you in return. But in Paula's case, she couldn't do anything for anybody. She just had to lie there and receive. Paula says, it felt wonderful. It was the most wonderful feeling I had ever experienced. They were simply just loving me because they loved me. They wanted to tend to my needs and the needs of the people I loved. They took over every job in the church that I had been doing. Once I got back on my feet and received a miraculous healing, I took a different approach to ministry. I had always been in charge of organizing the daily vacation Bible school, and I would call and call people to volunteer. I would try my hardest to get people to sign up to help, but I wasn't realizing that I was putting them under a guilt to serve. John chimes in. That's the next symptom. Performance-oriented people put people under guilt to make them jump. Paula says, but this year I just decided this is the Lord's project. If they want me to initiate something, I'm going to just make a simple announcement. And I did. I said, if you want to help out, sign up on the list at the back of the church. So many people volunteered to teach that we had team teachers for every class. And the most important thing was that everyone had a glorious time that year. It was relaxed and they had fun because they had been given an opportunity to give of themselves. John says, there's the next symptom. Performance-oriented people demand performance. People are not free to give it. When Paula died to her performance, now the people were free to give. The next symptom, you can have performance-oriented churches where the leadership is performance-oriented and nobody's free to make a mistake. So the atmosphere is tense and people are filled with worry. And because you're tense, you end up making more mistakes. Once you die to that, then you're free to goof up. And because you're free to goof up and make a mistake, you don't end up making mistakes as often. If you do end up making a mistake, you can laugh about it. So that ends the testimony of Paula. That was just edited parts of a longer testimony. But 
there's nothing I've heard that better describes the details and the thinking and the toxic nature of performance orientation. So I'll just give you some more quotes from the book. Performance orientation does not mean one who works hard, but one who works hard for the wrong reasons. A free person may work even harder in the same works, but instead of being impelled by fear and insecurity, now they're impelled only by love. Performance-oriented people require constant affirmation. They cannot handle criticism well. As we said, their security is not first in God and themselves, but their security is about what people think of them. They're dependent on the reactions of others. Love is not given when others have not done well because the performance-oriented person thinks they don't deserve it. And that becomes the lie behind that thinking. That performance-oriented person cannot conceive that he's accepted just because he exists, but only if he conforms to the prevailing patterns. Therefore, the rule is anxiety gets amplified into dread, and dread ends up with this person just doing compliant performance in order to please people. And to that degree, that fear of pleasing people binds all of his life. Hebrews 2.15 says, Who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. How ironic it gets twisted with performance orientation. The death that that person fears is not a physical death, but to the performance oriented person like Paula who said she was so tired, physical death would actually mean a release from all the work. Rather, the performance oriented person fears dying to a world of control because they falsely come to believe that that control guarantees them the right to belong and to be loved. They need that structure in order to feel good about themselves. It's so hard for them to think about just being spontaneous because the formula is, I've got to control everything so I can manage my image. That type of fear of death, of that control structure, prevents even Christians, born anew believers, from ever changing. But we cannot change until we receive the unconditional love of the Father that reaches into the frozen corners of our hearts, and the real death to self finally sets us free. Performance-oriented people are sometimes afraid to even try new things because it isn't okay for them to fail. Not that they don't do it, but the point is that they do it with fear. And all normal people fear, but in performance-oriented people, the fear of failure rises more out of what the loved ones and other people will think of them than how that failure might hurt another person. Security, which makes fun of trial and error, is gone. The performance-oriented person wants to know right up front what the rules are. The subliminal message is, tell me how to do it, because I want to do it well so I can feel secure. I want to know before I venture out so I can feel good about myself. I need to be in control. Therefore, performance-oriented people have a hard time being spontaneous. Self-control is a virtue for them, but it's to the point of idolatry and, and rigidity. They're always poised and correct, especially in public. But the more people and new circumstances the performance-oriented person encounters, the harder he has to work to learn the rules and the roles. If he's thrown under too much pressure, he might crack. He can't conceive that he's accepted just because he exists. In the church, performance orientation manifests as a religious spirit rather than pure Christianity. Religion in the dictionary is defined as a desire to please a divine ruling power. It's man's search for God. Man using Bible study, church attendance, good works, and devotion to try to find and please God. But authentic Christian faith is exactly the opposite of religion. It's God initiating, God finding man, and giving to mankind out of his unfailing heart of love. Not because he deserves it, but because God's a good father. In religion, man hangs on to God, but in authentic faith, God hangs on to man. In religion, there's striving and fear and false guilt. We feel like we're never good enough and we can never quite make it. But in authentic faith, there's rest and there's peace because our lives have been released into the Father's hands. And we really trust at the deepest level that he'll do a better job with us than we can. 
In authentic faith, all striving is undergirded with peace because we know that God has us. We are loved and chosen. We could fall out of fellowship with God on a temporary basis, but we never fall out of a love relationship with God as his sons and daughters. He will not disown us. And when we do break fellowship, he's waiting like the father in the story of the prodigal son. He comes and gets us. So we're secure. We're free to goof. And because we're free, we don't need to goof so often. If we want to raise children in a healthy, loving culture, one of the best things we can do to prevent performance orientation is to give them lots of hugs and physical affection. In all the years of counseling people, the Sanfords found that the most important thing that parents can do for their children, more important than private school and tutoring lessons and music lessons, more important than anything, was just hugs, kisses, and physical affection. Lots of it. The simple rule, John says in the book, is this. Where much laughter and affection are present, children learn they are accepted no matter how well or poorly they perform. They are free to be. When children who've just goofed up badly can leap into their parents' arms and all of them can laugh and learn, even when discipline has to be applied, children learn that the nasty side is also me and is loved and lovable too. 1 Peter 4.8 says, Love covers a multitude of sins. And nowhere is that more true than in the helter-skelter of children's emotions. Unconditional love, not taken for granted but often expressed, grants security to venture the all sides of me that a little child is discovering. And freedom to choose which modes to settle into from an altogether different base than fear. Conversely, Uptight, rigid demands of behavior without affection clamp upon children the manacles of control. The idea is being conveyed that you will not be loved unless you deserve it. Once that lie is grafted in, it becomes the governing trunk to all our fruit. All our actions will flow from that stem. Christian love ought to be the opposite of performance-oriented behavior. John writes as part of his own personal testimony in Transformation Inner Man... All such structures as performance orientation carry reward system with them. So long as we prefer the rewards, we will not change. One time I kept trying and trying not to do a particular sin, praying about it over and over, only to end up doing it again. Finally, I got mad at God and cried out, Why don't you help me with this? He answered quickly and succinctly, You aren't disgusted enough yet. Hate of that sin had not yet fully become ripe in me. God then told me, you're still enjoying that thing. I do not, I said. I hate it. God said, son, if you hated it enough, you'd quit. You enjoy it. That led me to ask myself in what hidden ways I might in fact be enjoying sin. The Lord began to reveal mazes of subterranean lines carrying hidden delights from one pocket of pus to another. Well, that's graphic language, but that's typical John Sanford kind of language to help give us a word picture. Pockets of pus inside of us. That's what has to die. That's what has to be brought to the cross. That's the root system. That's the bad fuel on the inside of us that's driving our behavior. We see the fruit. We see in performance orientation the striving that happens and the overworking and everything Paula described in her testimony but Holy Spirit needs to reveal the root so that it can be taken to the cross. I can give you an example. In a church setting, I was a worship leader for many years. And that's one of those areas where performance just goes hand in hand with playing an instrument. From the time you're a little child, you're being given music lessons. And every week when the teacher comes, you're expected to have done the work, to have perfected that lesson that week. Parents are paying good money for the lessons and there's pressure rightfully so, put on us in order to perform. Well, now people get saved and they're playing in a band at the church, they're singing in a choir, and there can be some performance that creeps into that. Shouldn't be the case, but it's human nature. We might want to get our validation from the fact that when we sing the solo on Sunday morning after the service, everybody's putting their hands around our shoulder and saying, oh, what a great job. It was so good. It was so anointed. Part of that's not bad, but if it's feeding something in us that needs that other man-pleasing kind of validation, 
we end up creating a monster. That's not who Jesus is. He doesn't want us operating in that kind of a mindset. He said, I came to serve, not to be served. So we could think of an example of a worship leader praying, Lord, please send us more musicians. Please send us more singers. But then what happens is, you know the old saying, be careful what you pray for, you might get it. All of a sudden, somebody comes into the band who's actually a better worship leader and a better musician than the existing leader. Well, if that leader is a performance-oriented person, he's going to feel very threatened now by this new person that just came in, even though he prayed for that person to come in. The threat is, what if I lose my position as the leader? So much of my personal worth and identity are tied into the fact that I'm the worship leader, that instead of feeling blessed by this person that just came in, I now feel threatened, and I can't allow myself to lose my position. That is carnal. That is demonic. We can't have that in the church and expect the church to be powerful and a life-giving culture. You can think of an example in the Bible of King Saul, who had been king, but God chose another king named David to come. And when Saul saw the anointing on David, he had a choice. He could have stepped aside and recognized that his turn was over and that God had found someone else, and he could have served under David. But instead, he chose to be threatened by David and to try to kill David and eliminate his competition, quote-unquote competition. Let me tell you, when it's from God, you can't eliminate the competition. The Pharisees thought they could do the same thing with Jesus. They were so caught up in their titles and who they were in the Jewish culture that when someone came along who had been a carpenter who was performing greater miracles than they were, who had a better understanding of the Word of God than they had, they were not blessed by that. They were threatened by that. It's insidious. We need to get to these subterranean pockets of pus, like John described, and we need to bring them to the cross and let them die. We're creatures of habit. We fall into these behavioral ruts. We get so used to dealing with relational situations in a certain way that we don't even realize how much damage we're doing. With performance orientation, we might be trying to outperform other people just in order to feel better about ourselves. But Jesus is the Word became flesh. He's love given from heaven unconditionally and unvaried by the good or bad behavior of another person. Christian love is born in the unfailing heart of Christ in us for the other person. How we act out that love may vary according to the other's behavior to be appropriate to the needs of the moment. Sometimes rebuke might be the action that love requires. Other times it might be tenderness or it might be withdrawal for a season. The point is that we are governed not by insecurity, but by the flow of Christ's love and wisdom. So whether you personally suffer from toxic performance orientation or you're trying to help other people get free from this, you hopefully now have a greater awareness of the problem. If the structure of performance orientation has been built into someone's life, it has to be dismantled. That's the crucifixion part of the process. But it takes faith to believe that God will resurrect a new godly structure on the other side of this dismantling process of the cross. But we believe he will. We've seen it happen in hundreds of people's lives that took that first step down the Via Dolorosa towards Calvary of bringing a structure like performance orientation to the cross. The dismantling can really begin by handling our emotions in a right way. Many people will ask us, Pastor Peter, I've been a Christian for 20 years. How could it be that I've never heard anybody teach on this before? What happens inside them as they're listening to this CD and, and this teaching is they start to remember their past, what happened with their parents, their coaches, their teachers, all important people in their lives who put this yoke of performance on them, and they're angry. They have to make a choice, though. What are they going to do with that anger? They can harbor it on the inside and allow it to just sit there like bitter stew on the inside, or they can choose to release that anger by forgiving the person. We have to believe the best about everybody. I believe that your parents did the best they could. Your coaches, your teachers, they did the best they could with what they had. In some cultures, performance orientation looks like the noble thing to do, outworking everybody else, like John talked about in the testimony about Paula. He grew up in an Oklahoma ranch culture. They just tried to outwork everybody, and they never complimented anybody. Well, that's just toxic. That's not God's way of doing it. 
So once you realize who it is, who the people were in your life that caused that problem, you've got to make a choice to forgive them. That's what it is. Forgiveness is a choice. Jesus says, let it go and forgive the person who hurt us, which is very good advice, but it's not easy to do. Here's another quote from Transformation of the Inner Man. The primary task of a Christian counselor, and I'll just add here, of a friend, of a Christian who's trying to help someone get out of performance orientation, that primary task is that of an evangelist bringing the gospel by circumstance and counsel into the unbelieving heart of an already believing Christian. That might sound like a contradiction to you. You could say, how can a Christian have an unbelieving heart? Well, they believe for salvation. They're saved. If they die, they go to heaven. But there's parts of their heart that have been hardened and stony that really don't believe. And this is a classic example. I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. I'm a Christian. I have lots of good fruit in other parts of my life. But there's performance orientation in there. And I really don't believe that God loves me unconditionally. So I have to keep working so hard and keep performing for him. So I guarantee to myself that I never lose his love. Well, sorry, that's a lie. You don't have to work harder for God to love you more. And the unbelieving heart is is a scriptural principle. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Take care, brethren. So he's clearly talking to Christians. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. So John says in the book, evangelism of the unbelieving heart of believers is the continuing and constant work of Christian ministers. We need to help performance-oriented people dismantle the lie that they'll only be loved if they perform well, that old structure's got to be removed. And nowhere else in all the culture that we live in can a performance-oriented person find rest than in the church. Only after he's again and again tested love in the church and received unconditional love back can he settle it in his heart that he's okay just because he exists in Christ. The world will not continue to accept him and forgive him unless he performs well. But the words, in Christ, is the key. Any man's spirit will be open to the accusation of Satan until he knows in the depths of his heart, even though he's imperfect, he's okay, just as he is, because the Lord Jesus Christ has become his strength and his salvation and his song. Paula says, every once in a while, when I get into too much work and not enough devotion, my motive base subtly starts to swing back from love to performance. But note the continuum. As the heart is softened, God has been able to deal with me more and more gently. How much easier might life go if our stubborn, unbelieving hearts could just hear this message? Romans 12.9 tells us that we're to hate that which is evil. And performance orientation is the central structure of that kingdom of self that we build. After 18 years of counseling others, John says, Paula and I are still discovering more and more areas in which our own forgotten childhood judgments of our parents and other authority figures have blinded our eyes to God. And we, who had good, loving, well-intentioned parents, fell into this trap. What about all the people who've been so fiercely wounded? Our first conversion might have resurrected our inner Lazarus. But now, as members of the body of Christ, let's be like the members of the fellowship of Bethany that were called by Christ to take the grave clothes off of Lazarus as we take the grave clothes off of one another's hands and feet and faces so that we can behold Jesus, life himself, and walk with him and hold his hand. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says, Beloved, Now we are the children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. So church, let's just realize these structures, like performance orientation, but many others that we'll talk about during this class, are stopping us. They're like the grave clothes wrapped around Lazarus. He had been resurrected, but he was still wrapped up. It required the body of Christ to come alongside of him and unwrap him. When Jesus appears, that doesn't just mean his second coming. When Jesus appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Picture yourself as Lazarus having those grave cloths removed from him. And now Jesus appears 
in his vision. And Lazarus can see him just as he is after having been resurrected. What an awesome picture for us today. 1 John 3 goes on to say, And everyone who has this hope fixed on Jesus purifies himself just as he is pure. So sanctification and transformation are another way of saying purifying. We are sanctified and set apart for the Lord. Any obstacles in our lives that are stopping us from fully serving him, he wants and we should want to have them removed. Purification happens by removing those obstacles. In Acts chapter 15, verse 8, Scripture says, So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. So I pray for you right now, those of you that are listening to this CD, that this teaching has a profound impact on you, that you get to know the love of God at a deeper level, that you don't feel you have to earn his love, but that you can accept his love unconditionally. At first, it might seem impossible. At first, there might be so much of your identity tied into what you do that this seems like something that's just too far beyond your reach. But I believe, and Holy Spirit bears witness to this in our experience, that as those onion layers get peeled back, you know what happens when you peel an onion, tears come, that's okay. He's going to peel back some of those layers and help you see where you have been striving and where ambition has crept in and your motives have been wrong. And he's going to allow you to just rest. Like Paula said, it was the greatest emotion she's ever felt when she realized that people loved her unconditionally and were willing to do for her even when she could not reciprocate and give it back. The Sanfords have a wonderful prayer in their materials that I'm going to read now that we can pray out loud together and you can re-listen to this CD to really try to burn it in. It's called A Prayer to End Striving. Lord, I've come to see my performance orientation. I confess to you that although my head believes salvation is by grace, my heart drives me to earn favor, to try to be good enough to present myself to others and you. I admit that I cannot change myself. The fear of not being accepted or loved is so overwhelming, it puts me into gear and I begin performing again. When acceptance is given with no strings attached, I cannot receive it. I ask you into my heart to do the work in me and for me. Bring my striving to death. I want to rest in your love. Help me remove the hindrances I've erected which prevent me from entering into your love. Lord, I've been angry with you for putting me into this family and into this position. I don't want my anger to keep me from you. So I ask that you restore my heart. I forgive my family any way they contributed to building performance orientation into my inner being. I ask your forgiveness for my angry responses, my fear and insecurity, my impure motives, and for not believing the truth. Lord, I accept my identity as your child. Help me learn how to live that identity in my daily life. Help me to feel. Help me to know within me that success is simply being your child. Help me to be like you. I ask you to bring to death in me the structures, the habit patterns of performing that I've created. I ask you to minister to the ambivalence in me when I want correction, but I can't receive it. Or when I want and need compliments, but cannot believe them. Help me take my eyes off my needs and my fears. Lord, I resign from trying to manage the whole universe. I give you my compulsive need to control people and situations. I recognize that I have wounded others by not affirming their contributions. I always had to be the one to edit or add or correct to their contributions because I thought I could always do it better. Forgive me for always being Martha and help me to hear when you call me to be Mary. Show me where I have taken on jobs or duties for the wrong reasons and give me the wisdom to resign from them if necessary. I want to be a good workman, but only with your strength and only in your will. In Jesus' name, amen.